In the last month, I've covered both the MCAS and NAD plus deficiency theories uh, for the pathophysiology of long COVID, uh, which help explain some of the uh, horrendous range of symptoms we see with the condition. With the help of Dr. Piers and Dr. Vensel, uh, in the last couple of films, I've made some recommendations for diets, supplements, and medication. Um, and as most of us long haulers will know, after eight to nine months, we've felt like we've tried pretty much everything. So how about these new recommendations? How about this, in particular, this stack of supplements? Um, does it work? <laughs> Can we actually prove that it does? Well, I've done a study to try and find out. Uh, and spoiler, uh, there's some pretty great results. The treatment plan for mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS, uh, consists of four stages, really. Uh, the first is a move to a low histamine diet. Uh, the second is a stack of supplements, the most important of which uh, is niacin. Uh, the third is to take um, over-the-counter medications like antihistamines. And the fourth is potentially prescription medications like H1 and H2 blockers, um, and potentially also mast cell stabilizers or inhibitors. The learnings from the NAD plus deficiency theory cover mainly a stack of supplements, uh, and they consist of uh, niacin, zinc, selenium, vitamin C, vitamin D, and quercetin. A quick important word on niacin. Uh, the flush version is used by Dr. Vensel, but this can cause adverse reactions in some people. Whilst it is an over-the-counter supplement available in 500 and 1000 milligram forms, if you do choose to start taking it, best to start at 25 milligrams to lessen the chance of an adverse reaction. However, some long haulers have had issues even at this low dose. I have to be clear and say that I am not a doctor, nor am I personally advocating that you take it. This is a decision you must make yourself with the consultation of your GP if you have any doubts at all. There is a link to these contraindications in the description. So without further ado, let's dive straight into the data uh, and see if we can show that any of this stuff actually has a positive effect on long haulers' recovery and symptoms. I surveyed 812 long haulers drawn from various support groups on Facebook and the Body Politic group on Slack. As usual, there are some caveats to this data that I ought to mention. Uh, this sample is both self-selecting and self-reporting, and the demographic is largely a representation of the use of the social media platforms involved. Um, however, uh, with regards to this study, I don't think those factors are going to make too much difference. As you can see here, the sample is mostly from the UK, with almost 15% from the US, and mainland Europe and Scandinavia being the uh, next largest groups. There's a very wide range of ages, but as you can see, there's a bit of a bulge in the middle in the 35 to 44 and the 45 to 54 categories. And 672 of them had changed their diet, supplements, or medications in the last month. Our control group, consisting of 140, had not. No, this isn't a double blind or randomized controlled trial, but it's as good as we're going to get for the time being. So first of all, let's look at our control group. In the last month, how many of them had noticed a change in their symptoms? Well, almost 31% had not. 29.5% uh, had a mixed bag, some improved and some worse. And almost 40% uh, had experienced a noticeable change. And what was that change? Mostly a little better. Uh, some significantly better and a very few feeling much better. Overall, 26.4% uh, of them got worse, and 74.6% of them were feeling a bit better. Given that the majority of these long haulers are now in the 8th or ninth month of illness, this backs up my other studies, generally speaking, that long haulers at this point are getting slowly better. One caveat here and that is human bias. We don't like to think of ourselves as stagnating or getting worse. So all of these results across all categories are likely to see some degree of positive bias. Arguably, this could be even more the case with the people who've changed their diet or started taking something new in the last month, as they're going to be positively motivated to believe that it's working. However, we can deal with that in the data, as I'll show shortly. So let's look at those groups we're testing. As I mentioned at the start of the film, the MCAS treatment consists of four parts. Uh, however, not everybody had done everything, so I looked at some of those smaller categories too, for people who had just taken the supplements or medication or some combination thereof, as well as people who'd 
basically done the full works. Uh, on this first question, have you noticed a significant change in your symptoms? 39.6% of the control group had. A number larger than this would suggest that the treatments or combinations had achieved something, although it could be good or bad. So let's look at the breakdown. Uh, firstly, those who had just started taking supplements. Um, the number drops a little bit here, that's interesting. Um, and those who'd taken supplements and over-the-counter or prescription medications, it rises again, uh, but still actually slightly less than the control group. Then those had moved to a low histamine diet. Um, massive 66% uh, here, but it's a somewhat small sample, so let's not get too excited. Um, then those who'd moved to the low histamine diet and started taking supplements, 46.3%. Um, so what's the correlation so far? Well, these two both include the low histamine diet and these two do not. Uh, so that low histamine diet would seem to be making a significant change to the symptoms. And what about those who'd moved to a low histamine diet, uh, started the supplement stack, and taken OTC or prescription meds? Well, the answer, 56.6%. So a lot higher than the uh, control group. Lots of numbers on this sheet. So let's turn them into some graphs. So as a reminder, here's the control group uh, generally getting better, uh, with the largest group being getting a little bit better. Overall, 27% 20%, sorry, getting worse and 73% improving. So let's take a look at the people who'd only taken supplements. Slightly better picture perhaps, uh, with only 19% reporting worsening symptoms and 81% improving. Now let's take a look at those who've done the full works of treatment for MCAS. Uh, so that's a change to the low histamine diet, uh, additional supplements and potentially medications. Now we're really rocking 95% of this group reporting some improving of their symptoms. Now if we compare that to the control group here, the control group represented by the grey and people who'd sort of taken the works for MCAS represented by the blue, uh, we can see the works doing better in all of these improving categories um, and actually no one reported getting a little bit worse. Now let's take a look at a slightly odd question I asked, which was, do you feel like there was a step change in the nature of your symptoms? Um, the answers here were a choice between uh, no particular change, um, a gradual change, and then a step change. My thinking here was that we might expect to see a step change in symptoms if the treatment that was started was actually working. So let's look down this column here. Only 13% of the control group felt a step change in symptoms. And we can see across these four categories here uh, that the low histamine diet might be making a change for people over and above just supplements and meds, 22% and 25.6 versus 18 and 23%. But what about people who've done the works? Well, that step change percentage goes up to 47.5%. Looks like it really might be doing something. And underneath here, you'll notice another category I'm going to be paying a little bit more attention to. This represents people who have taken niacin in some combination with the rest of the stack. Uh, they may or may not have changed diets and meds. And at 33%, you'll notice more of this group than any of the other subgroups here um, actually felt a distinct change in symptoms. And we're going to come back to that shortly. Now, here's a breakdown of which symptoms people reported improvements in. And this is really where we can start to get a sense of the efficacy of the treatments and consequentially the validity of the hypotheses, both for MCAS and NAD plus deficiency as being parts of the puzzle for long COVID. So we've got four groups here. The original control group uh, who didn't change their diet, supplements or medication in the last month. Then we've got this supplements excluding niacin group. Uh, these people had started taking supplements in the last month. They may have also changed diet or taken medications, but the one thing they all had in common is that they'd not included niacin. This group is important as it acts as a kind of secondary control. These people had all changed something and were motivated to report positively on it. It's human nature. We all want to think uh, that something we're taking has worked. It's the placebo effect. Now, of course, it's not a pure placebo. Uh, their diet may well have improved symptoms as had their medication or other supplements. But it gives us a great baseline to test whether niacin as the most important part of the NAD plus deficiency treatment stack actually works, and thus whether the NAD plus deficiency theory holds weight. 
So this next category, uh, the stack including niacin, uh, is identical in all respects to the previous group, uh, only they were taking niacin. Uh, so they may or may not have changed diet or other medications too. Uh, one thing, unfortunately, that we can't be sure of is that they were all taking niacin, not nicotinamide, uh, which is often labelled as niacin in the States. Uh, if some were taking nicotinamide, uh, which according to Dr. Wenzel is not effective, uh, this would effectively disadvantage this group and drag the results closer uh, to the supplements group. And finally, of course, we have the works, uh, people who change diets, supplements and medications. So rather than looking at this sort of wall of numbers, let's take a look at a chart. So straight away, we can see there's a pattern. Uh, the control group in grey uh, improving at a a lower frequency in each and every symptom. And people who are taking the blue, that's the, sorry, people who are taking the works, uh, that's the dark blue here, we're reporting improvements more frequently than any other group in each symptom too. But what about our niacin comparison? Well, niacin in the turquoise uh, here seeming to help with fatigue, uh, neurological, GI issues, and insomnia. Uh, and that's where it outperforms the pale blue of the supplements only group next to it and by a fair old margin in some of these too. But of course, this isn't the whole picture. Uh, we all know long COVID comes in waves and some people report worsening symptoms. Uh, so how did these categories look for those? Well, broadly speaking, it's the reverse picture. Uh, the gray of control here, um, often but not always reporting high frequency of uh, worsening symptoms. And in all categories bar insomnia, uh, it seems that uh, people taking the works, which is represented by dark blue again here, uh, report their symptoms worsening less frequently uh, than the control group. And what about our niacin comparison? Well, look at fatigue here. Uh, the turquoise of niacin smashing the light blue supplements group. Um, obviously, the lower percentage here being a, a win because fewer people reported that symptom worsening, uh, but also breathlessness, neurological uh, and GI issues. But wait, you say, these groups are all varying sizes. And are these variances even statistically significant? Well, let's take a look. In statistics, the T and P numbers are key to understanding whether the group that you're measuring is statistically any different from your control group. The higher the T number, the greater the evidence that there is a significant difference. The closer it is to zero, the more likely there isn't a significant difference. And simply put, the P value represents the probability of the observation of difference being due to chance. T numbers higher than 2 start to get interesting, and P numbers less than 0.05 are generally considered to be statistically significant. Now, I ought to point out that I don't have the wherewithal to do this kind of analysis. Uh, so I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Dr. Laura Rodrigo, uh, a fellow long hauler, uh, who helped me crunch this data with a linear regression. I'll pick through the highlights here. So this section refers to whether people felt better or worse over the last month and by how much. Um, so there are slightly different group definitions here in this analysis. Uh, there is the control group, uh, here they are, and they didn't change their diet supplements or medication in the last month. Uh, they are the reference group for this analysis. Uh, then we have the supplements group, uh, people who took supplements other than niacin but didn't change their diet. Then we have the niacin group. These are the people who took supplements including niacin but also didn't change their diet. And the diet group, uh, these are the people who adopted a low histamine diet but didn't take niacin. Uh, finally, we do also have the works. These are people who added niacin uh, and also went to a low histamine diet. So what do all these numbers actually say? Well, firstly, this pair of numbers here for supplements uh, do not differ significantly from the control group. The T number here of uh, 1.23 uh, isn't really high enough, it's pretty low, and the P number of 0.22 um, is pretty high. So basically, the new supplements people have started in the last month haven't statistically made a difference. Uh, but look at this, uh, the diets, uh, the niacin and the works groups have all significantly improved compared to both control and supplement groups, as you can see here with the yellow marker significance. 
the niacin has a T number of 2.5 and a P number of 0.01, so that's well inside the usual statistical significance score of 0.05. Uh, and the diets and uh, the works groups uh, fare even better. So what does this mean? Uh, well, changing to a low histamine diet or taking niacin really does make you feel better. And kind of obviously, so does doing both. And because uh, Dr. Rodrigo is very smart, she ran the analysis again, uh, but this time changing the reference to how the other groups compare against the niacin group. And what do we see here? Um, well, the very strong performance against the uh, control group, uh, as we would expect. So this is niacin versus control. And how does the uh, niacin group compare against the supplements group? So again, as a reminder, this is the difference between people who took additional supplements but didn't change their diet versus the people who started taking niacin but also didn't change their diet. Well, it's a marginally significant result. Uh, the P number here of 0.08 uh, when we'd be looking for something under 0.05. There are lots of variables in this analysis though, as people in either group may or may not have also been taking additional medications and different supplements. So let's change the group slightly to exclude diet as an eliminating factor. So that is to say that this new niacin group includes everyone who started taking niacin and uh, this new supplements group that actually is the control in this analysis here uh, includes everyone who started taking supplements as long as they didn't include niacin. So both groups may or may not have changed diets and may or may not have taken additional medication. And what we're seeing is a slightly stronger result here, down to 0.068. So what are we to make of all this? This is far from a perfect study. If I was to compare it to a uh, double blind or randomized controlled trial, uh, I would even maybe go as far to say uh, it's a little bit quick and dirty. But these are quick and dirty times. We can't necessarily wait for the massive wheels of the research institutions to start turning and pump out some answers in three years time when every day that goes past at the moment is a struggle. In recent films, I've looked at both mast cell activation syndrome and the NAD plus deficiency theory as parts of the potential puzzle for long COVID pathophysiology. And treatment regimens are born from these hypotheses. For mast cell activation syndrome, the low histamine diet is key, uh, along with the additional uh, supplements and medications that help manage uh, some of that excess histamine. Um, and for NAD plus deficiency, uh, the addition of nicotinic acid or niacin is absolutely key. It's those are the levels that need to be replenished in order to start trying to uh, counter the effects of that NAD plus deficiency. And if we can see those treatment regimens working, then not only does it mean that we have some ability to actually manage and improve our long COVID symptoms, but it also suggests that there could be uh, some serious weight behind those hypotheses. Let's start with MCAS. Uh, I suspect that not every long hauler is affected by this to the same degree, and that might be represented by the results we're seeing uh, with those who've chosen to change their diets, seeing the most dramatic uh, improvements, because ultimately they were the right people uh, for whom MCAS was a larger part of the puzzle. But either way, I think the results we've seen here are really pretty significant. So I think it's fair to say that MCAS does play a real and significant role in the presentation of long COVID symptoms. And what about the NAD plus deficiency theory? Well, this sits a little bit higher up the causality chain and can explain everything from post-exertional malaise to the consequential mast cell activation. The final results I presented show, broadly speaking, uh, a 93% probability that niacin is responsible for improving long haulers' symptoms. And we saw directly in the results the amazing impact on fatigue and neurological symptoms. I'd love to see some cleaner studies to test this theory that could really put it beyond doubt. But as far as I'm concerned, I think Dr. Wenzel and his team are absolutely onto something uh, with NAD plus deficiency playing some significant role in the long COVID illness. And so when we bring it all together, we come to the end of 2020 with some positive news about long COVID. Who'd have thought? We've got a pretty good idea for what's responsible for a large number of the symptoms and, dare I say it, a statistically proven way to go about treating the condition. Until next time, happy Christmas. <laughs>